Mercenary Star, The Saga of the Grey Death Legion by William Keith Jr. I'm reading this as an audiobook, as a personal reading. You can listen to me and enjoy the book. I have no affiliation with the author or the book in any way. Prologue. Those who have never seen a battle mech up close can never comprehend the raw power and mechanical precision of these 10 meter tall armored giants. The smallest weigh 20 tons and can stride across uneven ground or leap over it with a speed and grace that belies their mass and complexity. The heaviest mechs weigh 90 tons or more and are equipped with enough weaponry to defeat a regiment of more conventional infantry. It is only desperation that could drive unarmed and unarmored humans to challenge these dreadnoughts in open combat, and that is exactly what happened on Verthandi. This planet changed hands in 3016 when the forces of House Kurita defeated the Steiner defenders at the Battle of Harvest in that year. Among his demands, Lord Kurita claimed sovereignty over the seemingly unexceptional Steiner world of Verthandi, located in the border reaches of the Tamar Pact region of the Lyran Commonwealth. Until that time, Verthandi had been a peaceful world of small villages set among blue-green hills. It was an agricultural world of lumber and coffee plantations scattered over the broad and fertile area known as the Sylvan Basin, with quiet resort communities lying across the tropical coast of its azure sea. The capital city of Regis was governed by Verthandi's ruling council of academicians, a democratic body elected from among the senior professors of government at Regis University. There was a local militia to investigate the rare crime, but war, politics, and interstellar intrigue were remote for the Verthandian state of day life. Then House Kurita descended with its iron male fist, and life on Verthandi would never be the same. Janice Taylor, Shapers of Men and Destiny, Avalon Free Press, 3031. Chapter 1 The night sky churned with smoke and fire, reflecting the lurid flames over the dying village. People ran, hastily grabbed possessions, clutched to their chests or carried in baskets. Their shadows vast and outlandish, where the fires cast them across broken pavement. There were shrieks and screams, babbled shouts and imprecations, a smattering of gunshots, all enfolded in the roar of the blaze devouring the village of Mountain Vista. The mad 3R marauder turned ponderously, its weapon-heavy forearms dropping into line with its next target. The sign above the building's broad, plate-glass windows proclaimed it to be a farm and plantation supply store. Fleeing civilians overflowed from the walkway in front of the store and spilled out into the streets. Engulfed in flames, an overturned ground car illuminated the panic and sent reflections dancing along the store's miraculously unbroken windows. The death machine's right particle cannon flared once, the air between the gun and the target ionized by a charged beam of eye-searing brilliance. One window shattered under the touch of a man-made lightning. Then something inside the building, stored bags of fertilizer perhaps, detonated with a concussion that jarred the pavement under the mech's feet. The remaining windows exploded outward into the street. Broken glass, splintered wood, and shards of ferrocrete block cutting through the mob like a vibroblade through unprotected flesh building's upper three stories seemed to hang suspended for an instant, then settled one atop the other on the ruin of the ground floor. Rubble and debris rattled against the marauder's legs a hundred meters away, as billows of smoke and dust rolled across the bodies of the silent dead and the shrieking wounded. Valdis Kavlevic grinned with savage satisfaction inside the heat of his neuro helmet. The marauder responded to his soft urgings. 
completing its turn and lurching with ground chewing strides toward the heart of the town. Infrared scanners fed him green colored images that blurred into white, where the heat of multiple fires etched dazzling traces on his view screen. Human figures fleeing from the marauder's wrath became eerie green shadows that ducked, twisted, and flitted across the screen. Kevlavik triggered the mech's autocannon, felt the solid chunk of fresh ammo carousels snap home, heard the thundering chatter of rapid-fire death from the weapon mounted just above his cockpit. White flashes stitched across the pavement, chewing through those fleeing green shadows with bloody abandon. This demonstration should please Regis Central, Kevlavik thought. There had been many reports that Mountain Vista was a staging area and refuge for raiders in the Regis area. Many of those shell-torn corpses were no doubt rebel, though Kevlavik cared little whether they were or not. The whole valley from Regis to the Sylvan Basin and as far east as the Verdant Mountains would see what resistance to Lord Corita meant. Mountain Vista's destruction would make other communities think twice before offering shelter or aid to Verthandi's rebel vermin. Something wanged off the marauder's tiny armor-bound cockpit window, leaving a bright smudge star on the tough plastic. Kivlavik calculated trajectories, swung his machine, and spotted movement on the IR scanner. The sniper was hiding in a shattered church tower, his perch a little lower than Kevlavik's cockpit. The sniper's rifle, an old hunting weapon of some kind, flashed again. Once more, the bullet smeared uselessly across the mech's canopy. Kevlavik urged the marauder forward. As his machine loomed over the broken-off steeple, he could see the sniper cowering inside. Scarcely more than a boy, he was obviously terrified, but wore the same camouflaged military fatigues favored by rebels in the Verthandian jungles. The boy threw his rifle down and raised his hand above his head. The mech's external mics picked up a shrill string of pleas for mercy, of surrender. Not for the first time, Kevlavik wished that his marauder had proper mech hands as he slowly raised the machine's left forearm to where the heavy, twin-barreled fan brace was less than a meter from the boy's side. Then he snapped on the external speakers. His voice, thunder loud through the amplifiers, made the sniper cringe. In the name of Governor General Farthandi and of the military forces of the Draconis Combine, you're under arrest. Climb on. The rebel understood. He scrambled across the rubble of the steeple and grabbed the handholds welded to the mech's metal forearm. Even an enemy sworn to die rather than surrender would think twice when faced with execution by a 70-ton marauder. Moving slowly and with precision, Kevlavik swung his captive up out of the steeple's ruin and over the street. Crouched there in alleyways, ruined buildings, and anywhere else they could find the illusion of cover, People were staring up at the monster machines silhouetted against the burning town. Kevlavik smiled. Good, he thought. To be effective, terror demanded an audience. Slowly, deliberately, Kevlavik's marauder kicked the broken church into rubble, then swept laser fire across people fleeing its collapse. The captive clinging to the marauder's arm screamed again, pleading with Kevlavik to stop. The church crumbled with a final roar and a billowing cloud of dust. Kevlavik flicked the massive forearm once, twice. The captive shrieked and clung to the handholds, his legs kicking over empty air. Kevlavik brought the mech's right arm across, the PPC muzzle. Still hot from his shot at the farm store, trailed smoke as he moved it. The captive shrieked again as hot metal brushed against him then wailed as he kicked and thrashed down the 8-meter drop to the pavement. The sniper was still screaming, riding against the partial immobility of a broken mech as the marauder's huge foot slowly descended on him. Part 2, or Chapter 2. As many times as he'd been over it, Grayson could not see what more could be done. 
Devic Eriton's offer was the only one the Grey Death Legion had received during their whole six months on Galatea. Unless he could get work for his unit, he'd be forced to disband so that his men could find other work among the larger, better equipped mercenary units. Galatea was a hiring center for mercenaries from across the Lyrian Commonwealth and beyond. Merc units or the representatives gathered here to look for work, and Galatea was where governments set their representatives to seek out and sign up mercenary fighters. The problem was that mercenary units were so common, most could muster full 12 mech com companies or even entire regiments. The Grey Death Legion numbered a mere five mechs upon arriving on Galatea. Only two of these, Lori Kalmar's Locust and Grayson's own Shadowhawk, were piloted by combat veterans. As the weeks passed, five more mech warriors had signed on, and two of them brought mechs of their own, raising the Legion's strength to seven. The unit had been able to hire Texan support troops too, then put in the time to drill these troops and to acquire salvage parts to repair and re-equip the mechs. Renfred Tor, captain of the jump freighter Invidious, had met and recruited a pair of aerospace pilots to fly close tactical fighter support for the unit in space or during ground combat. Meanwhile, Sergeant Ramage was transforming the ground troops into a unit well-trained in anti-mech and mech support infantry tactics. Now the unit numbered just 186 men and women, including all of the ground members of the aging Invidious. The techs, Aztecs and ground infantry they had brought from Trelwyn and the handful of experienced men they'd been able to recruit here on Galatea. Grayson knew that it would be all for nothing if he could not find a patron and quickly. Precious few employers were looking to sign up a unit of less than two full lances, especially a newly organized one with only a single campaign under its belt. After six weeks, Grayson had spent most of the money that the grateful government of Trelvin had awarded him for freeing them from the tyranny of House Curita's Duke Hassid Rykol. After paying the Galatean port fees and buying salvaged parts for the mechs, fuel, food, weapons, and ammunition, not to mention bribes for port officials, which was the only way to get through the bureaucratic red tape, Grayson barely had enough left to pay the troops. In fact, just two weeks before, he had stopped paying the unit in sea bills and had begun to issue them promissory notes instead. No merchant in Galport would accept the unit's own notes as payment for anything, and very soon neither would the Legion. Grayson had first met Eridan in one of the Galport Strip's innumerable bars. The place was named Marauder Bills, though some earlier patron had shot out the B in the neon sign, leaving only Marauder Ills. Renfred Tor had made the first contact with the man and then later brought Grayson along to meet him. Marauder Bills, or Ills, was typically of a hundred similar establishments within a kilometer of the Caliport Gate. Outside, it was all grime-coated, sun-baked, age-peeling whitewash. The cracked facade shimmering in Galatea's desert heat. Within, it was dark and marginally cooler, with the sounds of raucous laughter and conversation punctuated by the clatter of glassware and an occasional drunken fistfight. Eridan had been sitting way in the back, well away from the pools of stage light in which naked dancers writhed away from the crowd of heavily armed mercs, maneuvering for spaces at the bar and central tables. Nothing about the man suggested that he might be a warrior, he was a full head shorter than Grayson's Carlyle's rangy height. His pale eyes magnified grotesquely by thick lensed eyeglasses. Those glasses identified him as a native of a planet lacking the technology for corneal implants or myopico corrective surgery. Lost tech was the word that had been coined for such a place a world that had begun the long fall from civilization to savagery during centuries of unremitting warfare. The word now applied only to those worlds that had lost the most. After all, the whole inner sphere of known space has suffered a similar decline in technology and the destruction of scientific knowledge. 
What sort of commission might await Grayson and his mercenary band on a lost tech world? He kept that thought to himself as he accepted Aridin's hand. You must be Grayson Carlyle, the man said, conversational enough as he stood up. Though his appearance was bookish, the small man's hand clasp was strong, and there was a look of quiet determination about him. Your pilot here has told me of a very great deal about you. Well, he's told me nothing about you, Mr. Aridin, so you have me at a disadvantage. Citizen Aridin, if you please, Captain, Tor said. He's the leader of a dandy little revolution a few tens of lights from here. Grayson had cocked an eyebrow at that. A few tens of light years? Suggested the region along the Lyran Commonwealth's border with the Draconis Combine. Such border areas between the various great houses were always tense enough to keep a mercenary units, arms, merchants, and whole fleets and armies busy. With planets trading hands along the frontier with monotonous regularity. Not the leader, no, Aridin said, seating himself. I am the representative for Barthandi's Revolutionary Council, however. We are fighting against House Kurita, and we need help, need it badly. I should damn well think so, Grayson had remarked. Just then, they were interrupted by a young lady dressed in more fake jewelry and feathers and clothing, who offered to take their order. Tor had ordered something called Lugan Coladas for everyone, but Grayson broke in to say he wanted only a glass of ice water, then turned to study his con Tor's contact as he picked up his, t his tail. For Thandy was the second of three of three world system of Norn, but the name had meant nothing to Grayson. Why should it? There were so many worlds. For Thandy had once been a peaceful world, Aridan explained. Its countryside devoted to agriculture. Verthandi had also been well known throughout much of the Commonwealth for its university at the capital city of Regis. That all changed, though, he said. Ten years ago, there was a major Kurita offensive. Grayson nodded. At Dahlgren, yes. He'd been there himself, though only a boy of ten at the time. That had been the year he'd formally become a warrior's apprentice in his farm father's regiment, Carlisle's commandos. He could still remember his father's anguish when one of the Krita Sword of Light regiments had dropped onto the commando's rear in the Battle of Dahlgren. They'd have to retreat or face annihilation. The Commonwealth formally ceded a number of border systems when they lost Dahlgren, isn't that so? For Sandy was one of them, Erdin said. The first thing the Combine did was to establish a naval base on our moon for Sandy Alpha. We had been totally reliant on the Lyrans for military support. Outside of a few freighters and merchantmen, we had nothing in the way of ships, not even for a short hop to our own moon. Grayson nodded again. Verthandi was a lost tech world of its, if its people however that dependent on others for transport and commerce. He knew, too, that House Kurita would not have encouraged them to become more independent but would have shifted the Verthandian's dependence toward itself. Worlds dependent on them for trade and high-tech gadgetry would unlikely to become rebellious. Aridin took a deep breath and said, The next thing we knew, they'd landed troops, engineers, and heavy equipment. Their surveys had suggested that Verthandi might be rich in certain metals, and they began mining for the stuff. He shrugged. We never paid much attention to such things. We kept to ourselves, governed ourselves. Galactic politics and the succession wars were rather outside our grasp, I'm afraid. Grayson's lips curved, more grimaced than smile, and he said, The Draconis Combine does not take well to the idea of self-government. They prefer to help. Tor said, help themselves, you mean. Aridin said, that's what it amounted to. Our planetary forces fought them, but they merely brought in more troops and seized our spaceport in Regis, the capital. They ordered new elections and saw to it that their own people took most of the council seats. They opened mines in the southern desert, working them with people rounded up at gunpoint from various communities. We fought back, of course. 
His thin shoulders rose and fell in a hopeless shrug. We fought back. We kept fighting back. But when they brought in the battle mechs, we couldn't keep the fight going. The Dracos burned whole towns, leveled villages. Any home suspected of harboring rebels was burned, and the families of rebels were shot or sent south to the mines. The Revolutionary Council finally decided it was time to look for health help off-world. I managed to get here by joining the crew of a First Andean merchant who overtly supports the Loyalist government and the Khan Line, but who secretly works with us. His ship got me to Grandin, and from there, I was able to arrange passage to Galatea. We'd heard that this is where we would find mercenaries for hire, and that I'd be able to buy radios, guns, and other equipment that we need so badly. The bar girl returned with their drinks. Ice clinked in the glasses as she set them down. That's five H fifty for the Lugans, she said, and three twenty five for the ice water. Eridan says, I'll be frank with you, Captain. As he counted off the money for the drinks, the Revolutionary Council sent me here to find a small, battle hardened unit to serve as a training cadre. Our forces have been scattered. Hell, we've been bloody well hammered into the ground every time we've tried to meet Kurita on their own terms. At the moment, We've been reduced to hiding out in the hills, in the jungle, sniping at the Dracos when we can. Erdin intently studied the glass in his hand. Sniping is not going to win the war for us. We know that. We need someone our people can rally around. Someone who can show us how to use what we've got to beat those brown jackets. I don't care how many battle mechs they've got. If enough of our people rise up, no mech force in the galaxy can stand against them. Grayson states, Heroic sentiments, citizen. Aridin's face flushed. I wouldn't expect a mercenary to understand. Grayson says quietly, Mercenaries fight for causes too, my friend. But I do have to look out for my people. What else can you tell me? Well, the rest was not encouraging. There were pieces of four Kurita battle mech regiments on Berth Andy, though only one was known to be at full strength, that still meant the Legion could be facing hundreds of enemy mechs. The situation was not as hopeless as it first appeared, or Grayson would simply have thanked Iridin for the time and left on the spot. Those four partial regiments were scattered all over Berth Andy's northern hemisphere. Tied down in garrison details in scores of towns and villages, airfields, and mines. The Combine forces were known to muster numerous aerospace fighters, too, but most of those were assigned to the Kurita base on Verthandi's moon. Finally, there were the eight regiments of Blues, loyalist militia directed by the Kurita puppet government in Regis. Though they numbered thousands of ground troops, Erdin said that their morale was low. There's nothing like a formal blockade, Erdan had explained. Your ship captain here said you could disguise your dropship to look like a Kurita Union-class freight hauler. If you did that, they might not challenge us at all. I can direct you to a landing spot in the Azure Sea area, where the jungle will shelter you. Once safely down, he continued, they would link up with the Revolutionary Council. The Legion's chief duties would consist of training cadres of Rathandian rebels, particularly in infantry tactics against battle mechs. It was not an enviable assignment. The unit was being asked to run a Kurita blockade and then to stand it, strand itself on a world garrison by hundreds of enemy mechs. They would have to avoid direct contact with a vastly superior enemy army while teaching the local rebels how to effectively fight back. The fact that they would be engaged in a bloody, fratricidal civil war simply increased the chances that someone would betray them to the Combine forces. Even if they succeeded in their mission, whether or not the Great Death Legion would ever get off Earth Andy depended on the success of what sounded like a ragtag rebellion. Most mercenary units would not even consider such a high-risk, uncertain mission. The Great Death Legion, however, could not refuse. But Agromax? Grayson thought. 
How in God's name did these rebels expect to fight with Agromex? In the end, they hammered out an agreement. Though Grayson still had his doubts, the Legion needed to com the commission. Either that or dissolve the unit, leaving each man for himself on Galatea.